Please open your Bibles with me this evening to the book of Malachi. Malachi, we're going to read in chapter 2, beginning in verse 11 through 15. Malachi chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Please stand with me, and we want to give our heart's attention to the inspired and infallible Word of God. Now we praise our great and good Father for giving us His Word. Verse 11. The word of God. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, <laughs> against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his good word. Our Father, which art in heaven, I pray that all that hear me can say, Hallowed be thy name. If they cannot, save them. Open their hearts. Father, we take up a subject about which little is heard. But I pray that thou wouldst give us a clear biblical understanding, a foundation for what we will consider in several messages. And I ask with all of my heart, O oh God, that Thou wouldst help me to speak these words with power, with wisdom, with care for the women in this congregation, as well the men. Come, O oh God, help us to think this evening. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Childbirth was designed by God created by God, and is sustained by God according to the purpose of God. Its importance cannot be exaggerated. That a man and woman can unite in an earthly physical union 
and yet give birth to beings that possess spiritual, immortal souls is astonishing. We take it for granted, and we should not. But women alone are mothers. There is no role swapping when it comes to this holy act. Women alone carry and bear children. And along with their husbands, women play a vital role in the nurture of children. Consider the following. Childbearing preserves the human race in this world. Childbearing brings immortal souls into this world. Childbearing brings God's image bearers into this world. Childbearing populates the nations of this world. Childbearing populates the churches of this world. And childbearing brought the only Savior of sinners into this world. And why has God ordained all that? Because God seeks a godly seed. Children who will learn and walk in the ways of God. It is indisputable then that childbearing plays an essential role in the unfolding of God's eternal purpose. His earthly purpose for human beings, His heavenly purpose for His elect, his judicial purpose for the reprobate, and his kingdom purpose for this world and the world to come. Every soul in heaven and every soul in hell will have first been conceived in this world before entering eternity. Nevertheless, in spite of the beauty and all, or, or awe of it all, women who birth God's image bearers into this world are exposed to physical, emotional, and spiritual dangers. They are often wounded during their pregnancies by sinful men's ignorance insensitivity and neglect, pierced by sinful children's disrespect, physically and mentally worn out by the demands of bearing and rearing children, and are specifically targeted by Satan and the powers of darkness because they and they alone carry the image bearers of God. Every child born, as far as we can see or tell, is potentially one of God's elect. Satan knows this. Why do you think you see so much uh, baby killing throughout the Scriptures? Why do you think that the abortion clinic in this city has been reopened? It is for one reason. The slaughter of human beings made in the image of God, whether those carrying it out believe such a thing or no. Because we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. They are only instruments in the hands of the murderers of human beings. Satan, who was a murderer from the beginning. 
there is little more satanic in this world than the destruction of a child in its mother's womb. Women bearing children need great encouragement, not a little. They need Christ-centered, spirit-wrought, word-enlightened, grace-filled encouragement. And they often don't get it. We need to reform how we view childbearing. Men especially need to be on board for the next few messages. I thought we're talking about encouraging women. That's exactly what we're talking about. And you are a huge portion of that. Whether you recognize it or no. <clears throat> women need encouragement from their husbands let me repeat that in case you were drifting women that are bearing children need encouragement from their husbands from their congregations and most of all from the Lord Jesus Christ Now, with that in mind, the title of our message is Encouragement in Childbearing. This is part one. May the God of physical and spiritual life grant us the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. And may our eyes be turned upon Jesus as we consider this vital subject. And I will tell you, brethren, it has been a war trying to study and prepare these messages. There has been monumental battle as I've attempted to prepare these. So I urge you to be praying. <clears throat> we need reform in a lot of areas. And it's the idea of reform doesn't stop with a handful of people saying, I'm a Calvinist now. So the first thing we want to consider as we lay the foundation to this introductory message is a brief exposition of Malachi's message. <clears throat> During the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Lord spoke to his people through Malachi, whose name means my messenger. Malachi rebuked the Jews for becoming ungodly, ungrateful backsliders, repeatedly neglecting and arrogantly breaking God's covenant. Reading Malachi is like walking into a long and heated family feud. With God, the head of the home, exposing and rebuking the members of his family. So great was the Jews' evil. God threatened, I will spread dung upon your faces. How's that for the God of love? It is the God of love. He is a God of holiness. And His covenant and His covenant worship matter. I will spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. Sacrifices were opened up. Their entrails contained dung. This was carried out, depending on the sacrifice, and burned outside the camp. God is saying, I will take that dung, I will ornament your faces with it, and I 
will have then someone take you out and drop you in the garbage bin. That's the idea. That's what he thinks of their worship. May God help us to consider our worship and the lives we're leading as we profess to be worshipers of the one true and living God. Now, despite God's strong words, Malachi promised hope in the coming messenger of the covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ. Malachi records God's six disputes with the Jews. In the first dispute, God's opening words to Israel were, I have loved you. I have loved you. But Israel talked back. Do we know what a gainsayer is? We should. A gainsayer is someone that talks back. Children, do your parents say something to you, call you to do something, call you down, try to get your attention? And do you talk back to them? I hope that's something you've learned really quickly not ever to do. And parents, I would urge you strongly to make sure that that's like capital punishment in your house. Because this is exactly the way the Jews were dealing with God. I have loved you. But Israel said, Wherein is had thou hast loved us? Wherein? How have you done that? God responded that he loved and chose Jacob, who became the father of Israel, but rejected Esau. In the second dispute, God condemned the Jews, especially her priests, the religious leaders of the people, for heartless worship. God despises, and I don't think we have a big enough view of God if knowing that He despises something doesn't make us shake. He despises heartless worship. They despised his name, corrupted his altar with defiled food, and offered blind, lame, and sick sacrificial beasts, all utterly offensive to God. He says, why don't you take those sacrifices and give them, give them to your governor and see if he likes them. This is powerful language. And the third dispute brings us to our text. And that's our context. God severely rebuked his people for profaning his holiness and for marrying foreign, idol-worshipping women. God turned His back from the Jews' worship. They're still gathering to worship. They still think they're fine with God. But He turned His back and would not receive their worship and their sacrifices. And they said, why? Wherefore? Why? And God answered. He answered that he had witnessed their marriage vows and many husbands had committed adultery, breaking their marriage covenant with the wives of their youth. We seem to forget, especially in our adultery worshiping culture that God attached the death penalty to adultery. That's why he tells them 
in another couple of verses to watch their step. He had seen, he had been witness to their vows made before him. God is witness to every marriage. Not just Christians, but to every marriage because it's his institution. It is a great tragedy. Not only were the Jews committing adultery against the wives of their youth, that precious one that they had once uh, loved fervently, who lay in their bosom, and now they had defiled those vows. God said, I witnessed both acts the vows and the breaking of the vows. That's what brings us to verse 15. Which is notoriously difficult both to translate and to interpret. Several interpretations are possible, but we will focus on just one. It begins with this question and did not he make one that seems most naturally to rise from Genesis 2 24 therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh if so <clears throat> then it means did not God make Adam and Eve one, implying that all husbands and wives are one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit. That seems to mean that Adam was not only flesh, but that God granted him a portion of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Adam's one flesh relationship with Eve was also a spiritual relationship. The next question is, and wherefore one? Or, and why one? Why did God make Adam and Eve one? The answer most likely arises from Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. If so, then the meaning is this. Why did God make them in that one flesh and spirit relationship that he might seek a godly seed. And notice, it doesn't say so that there just might be more babies. There is to be a character about these children. And that is the responsibility of the parents to whom God gave those immortal souls. God is seeking a godly seed. Children that are His image bearers and brought up being taught who He is and what He calls us as His image bearers to be. When the Jewish men married idol-worshipping women or when they divorced their Jewish wives, they jeopardized the possibility of bringing forth godly children. Godly children don't just happen.
God is looking not only for image bearers, but for people to populate this world walking in his ways, bringing him glory, advancing his kingdom. It's tra- it's, this is tragic. In the day in which we live, many Christians are avoiding having children or they just want to make sure that it's convenient or it's just all about them and having a family. Even when they say it's, well, uh, we need to have a family before God. Well, yes, it's a family before God, but there is purpose inherently in this act. God intended his covenant relationship with his people to produce covenant relationships between men and women with a view to producing godly children. There is eternal purpose worked out in history in the act of child bearing. It's not just a biological experience. It is the outworking of infinite genius, the extraordinary design of Almighty God who made male and female and gave them the ability and blessed them to reproduce His image bearers who are to fill up the earth for His glory. That's good theology. It's not just a biological happening. While not all married women are able to bear children, and while some purposefully remain single to serve the Lord without distraction, God's primary purpose for marriage is a covenant companionship that brings forth children for God. Mothers, then, are vital in the eternal purpose of God in the outworking of His glorious redemption and the advancement of His kingdom. By saying this, and please make sure you hear me, by saying this, we're not looking down on women that are single. We are not looking down on women that are barren. We are not viewing women without children as second-rate human beings. Ever. We are saying quite simply that God's primary purpose in marriage is bringing children into the world who will walk in His ways. Now that's ultimately in His sovereign hands. We'll see all of that. But our responsibility should be at least clearing up to us if it hasn't been. We're not, uh, we're not playing a game among homeschoolers to see who can have the most children to prove how spiritual they are. In fact, some women with many children are miserable. That can be for a number of reasons. But the fact of the matter is, it's not a, a chalk mark hash marks to say, oh, look at how spiritual we are. That's nothing but pure legalistic thinking. That is works righteousness, baby righteousness. That's why we have to be focused on what it is 
God's doing. God is looking for a godly seed. So we, we see the sovereignty of God in His eternal purpose. We see our responsibility in bringing children into this world for His glory. It's not whether we have a dozen or one. The point is why we're doing it. That's the issue. I've been around homeschoolers enough to see the kind of pride and self-righteousness that preens among some over this very subject. We need genuine biblical reform in our thinking about childbearing. And we, not, we need to have a lot higher view of women and a lot stronger encouragement. So for that reason, childbearing women need encouragement. They're a vital part of the outworking of God's purpose of redemption. What kind of target do you imagine that might be for the powers of darkness? So, in the messages to come... <clears throat> We're going to consider three uh, or four major thoughts. Four major thoughts. And I will leave a big enough door open to say there might be more. But at least at this point, we're going to look at, at the very bottom line four. The first one is this. More than anything else, more than anything else, childbearing women need spirit. Spiritual encouragement. First on the list. Spiritual encouragement. <clears throat> Unfortunately, experience usually shows that even Christian women spend more time being concerned about their physical condition than their spiritual condition. And it's an easy error to fall into. <laughs> Their bodies are going through an extraordinary change. And they're feeling that. And men don't. <clears throat> but far too often we have focused on the physical, on the biological, as if that's all that mattered. Of course, we want a healthy birth. Of course, we want healthy mothers. Of course, we'd like to see them make it full term. And we all know that sometimes it doesn't happen. All the more reason that the focus should be on spiritual things as they go into the extraordinary journey of pregnancy. It is vital to be concerned and, as I've mentioned, very often it's easy for men who don't know what this experience is uh -uh, even to overlook the physical experiences that your wife is having. But how serious are you about spiritually encouraging your wife as she's carrying that human life. We're going to spend a good bit of time on that. Husbands ought to be there and not just saying, Oh Lord, hope we have a safe baby. That's important. But oh God, strengthen my wife. This is my right arm. This is my right eye. This is my partner who is working with me to obey you. We're wanting to be fruitful we're wanting to multiply, and we know that that invites the hosts of hell. 
grant us grace. Oh, give her strength. Give her spiritual strength. Help her to understand that childbirth is not just about having a baby. It is a spiritual act. It is a holy act. It's a holy spiritual event when you bring an image bearer of God into this world. Those souls will spend eternity in heaven or hell. There isn't any other option. How spiritual is that? You're giving birth to an immortal soul, a man and a woman by God's blessing, is doing something that is astonishing. And that, that human being, that baby, will live in the glorious presence of Christ for eternity, will be made like Christ, seeing Him as He is, or will lie down in the flames of hell for all eternity. What kind of spiritual plans are you making? What kind of of spiritual climate, dads, are you making in the house for that very event and encouraging your wife along as she carries the physical burden of it? So, we're going to take some time to consider that heading. We want to consider it from the eternal perspective first. How often I have heard women and men say, um, well, this one wasn't exactly planned. Well, it was. Maybe not on your calendar, but it was the living God. <clears throat> a woman's spiritual condition, and I will say this a lot, is often neglected in the light of the physical. And again, that's easy to happen, especially if a woman's having a difficult pregnancy. What are you thinking about? Husband's thinking, my wife, is she safe? The baby, is it safe? But you want to make sure that she's spiritually safe, encouraged, Knowing and experiencing an encouragement that builds her up in the faith as she experiences childbearing, child carrying and child bearing. Secondly, we want to consider that childbearing women need encouragement because of the physical difficulties and dangers associated with childbearing. We do have marvelous technology today and a greater understanding of childbearing and of the, and of the human body and, and all the processes than we ever have. And it, it is marvelous that we have women's hospitals very often. Uh, and of course, all hospitals uh, uh, have um, those particular departments where they, they care for women in, in, their, in all of their femaleness. <clears throat> we know a lot now, and it's, it's astonishing to think how many children are now born safely uh, when 150, 200 years ago, uh, not nearly as many of them would have survived, nor the mothers. There have been times throughout the history of, of uh, this world where, at least according to what numbers we can put together and, and uh, make some uh, intelligent estimates, uh, as much as 50% mortality was the reality of children. Uh, we, we don't see that in our day, in our country. And that's a mercy and a blessing from God. The great tragedy is now that we're doing everything we can to murder millions of them. And not only that, 
but many Christians have so bought in, they've been so brainwashed by the culture, they're doing all they can to avoid children. And if you have more than two, you'll have some very wise and aged saint come up and say sometime, hopefully without too much sarcasm, don't you all know how that happens? It's one thing when the world thinks like that. You're taking up my air, you know. You're taking my space. But when you get that kind of stuff from Christians, it tells you how far we have fallen from the biblical picture. So, when the scriptures speak of great pain, great trials, great calamities. It most often illustrates them with woman's labor. Men, do we hear that? Just a few examples. We, as I said, we'll develop these and we'll look at more. But just a few quick examples. Isaiah says, Howl ye! Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Then comes the description. They shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. It doesn't say, like a man who hits his thumb with a hammer. This is spirit-guided imagery that needs to land in our hearts for meditation. Because it's telling us something about women, men, that we often don't get, even when we're present for the birth. In Isaiah, Judah cries out, Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. Thirdly, experiencing child-bearing women or Thirdly, childbearing women need encouragement because of the emotional challenges they experience. And those are connected uh, to the physical ones. While we can separate them to examine them, uh, they go hand in hand. The absolute astonishing glory of a woman's body and her ability to bear God's image bearers is really worth studying. Just to stand in awe of what God has done. But unfortunately, a lot of men miss that those remarkably beautiful bodies that are going to swell and, and face all kinds of uh, aches and pains and discomforts and even sometimes great physical challenges, <clears throat> we often are just kind of waiting for it to be over, hoping she'll feel better. This is the wrong attitude. This is the wrong approach. That's why spiritual encouragement has to be top of the list. And looking at a wife and realizing, wait a minute, especially those who have more than one, <clears throat> I've been at work all day and she's been bearing that new body in her, ba in her womb. Uh, she may be as nauseated as she can be. If you try to function with nausea, man, guys, I'd just love to see it. 
I'm having to take a medication right now for one of the other medications I'm taking to conquer nausea. And I'm going to tell you, when that fills me up, it's hard to move. It's hard to think. It's hard to feel efficient about anything. It's just, I just want the world to stop. Mamas with little children don't get the world to stop. There are emotional challenges that come with that experience. And that's just one. We're going to list them. You want to make sure you're here for that night. But I say all of this because this is a spiritual matter. It's not just, oh, another baby. Oh, another mouth to feed. Oh, another bill. This is obedience to the Lord. It's one obedience among many. But when a woman agrees that her body should um, magnify God by bringing forth little ones, she's stepping into a dangerous area. Both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The last point we want to develop, I trust all the men here will be looking forward to this. If the childbearing women need encouragement because their husbands often do not recognize or sympathize with some or all of the three things we've just talked about. I had a friend who used to, this was a Christian man, <laughs> who in the church we were in was the head of the board of elders. There's no such thing as a board of elders, but that's what they had. <clears throat> and he would say, when his wife would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have another baby. He would say, wonderful. I'll be praying, seeing you in nine months. <clears throat> now, he, he was kidding at one level. See in nine months. That's the way a lot of men are. And I'm talking about Christian men. Even when they don't realize it. Very often there's never been a thought in our minds about all the stuff that needs to be reformed is the way we look at how we even got into this world. This is not little. This is huge. And it's something that men should take most seriously. That's your beloved. That is your queen. That is the love of your life. As the Puritans would say, she's a part of you. She's a part of you. How much do you enter in to what's happening with her? I bought a few apps anatomy apps and have done some looking and watching of, of animations you know that that just go through the process and I'm astonished at what God does with every single birth but we don't think much about it because it's kind of just part of the furniture of being a human being right get married have some children there you go this is why I ask all of you that want to be married, one of the questions I'm going to ask you is, why do you want to get married? One of the things you should say in answer is to honor the Lord in bringing forth children. That's not the only reason to get married. <clears throat> but if that isn't in your thinking, which it isn't in many young Christians today, that needs to be corrected. It isn't just all about my relationship. It's about a covenant relationship that brings forth God's image bearers. Well, if men are sensitive to anything about a woman's preg pregnancy, and some are, it's usually about the physical challenge because they're so obvious. Right? When you see a woman who's in her seventh and eighth month, and the way she stands, I can't do it. 
I've seen some that were just astonishing. I want to tell you because the world generally isn't going to tell you. You're beautiful. That's true beauty before God. And I say this with joy. Waddle to the glory of Christ. Because this is what God is doing. He is doing something and your body is showing it. Can't hide it, generally speaking. And it's a glorious thing. And men should stand in awe. And they should say, okay, I'm part of this. And when I see that body changing, and look how when you, when you begin to see the baby moving, is that an elbow? Is that a foot? Is that the head? When you see that there is real life, and not just physical life, but spiritual life, we should be awestruck. Yes, we want to make sure that they're comfortable. At least I hope you think that because they're generally not. They need to be comforted. So, this is not a little thing. And I repeat it, it's huge. Men and women are blessed of God to procreate. To, they've been given an extraordinary command from God to fill up the earth with his image bearers. And we want to think about that in a right way. I am delighted beyond words that we have a congregation where we don't have the wizened older older person who says, don't you know how that happened? To my knowledge, that's never been said here. (laughs) And if you've ever said it, don't ever let me know. Secondly, we have a culture of life here. This is what should be happening in any church of Jesus Christ. It should be a culture, a community of life. Because we want to see those little ones come into this world. And we want to teach them the glories of the Savior. We want them to know that they're sinners. And we want them to understand that they are before the judgment seat of God. But that there's a Savior to save them from the day of wrath. We want them to know that Christ himself, the very Son of God made flesh, the one born of a woman, made of a woman, made under the law, came into this world and said, let the little children come to me. We want them to know that Jesus. We want our homes not only to be cultures of life, we want them to be gospel cultures where it is obvious to our children as they grow up. They won't get this at first, but if you faithfully stay with it, they will realize that Christ is really the head of your home. Christ is the one for whom you live. Christ is the one you serve. Christ is why you do what you do and don't do what you don't do. And that you want to see by God's grace, by God's mercy, uh, that your years of investing into those little ones with the gospel, eventually that life, everlasting life, enters their souls and they walk with Christ. How important is that? Well, it it begins when your wife says, we're going to have a baby. We ought to be thinking with all of our hearts, good. We want to pray, magnify the Lord, and do all that we can to bring this little life into a huge Christ-filled life. Amen. Our Father, we love Thee and thank Thee. Thou art searching. Thou art seeking a godly seed. Help us with that. Help us to understand it more clearly. Father, please, we are looking for men to understand and for women to understand and for their hearts and minds to be united 
in seeking thy face in how to walk this out in a way that brings thee glory and does much good not only to the home but to the church of Jesus Christ to the community in which they live to this world and always most hopefully with the glories of everlasting life coming down and indwelling those precious little ones. We pray it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's stand. <sighs> now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Let's go in the